Hi, welcome to Harlem America Digital Network's flagship show, What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. We're going to go behind the scenes today to find out what it's like to work with a legendary publicist, someone who's had such high profile artists as Michael Jackson, Dionne Warwick, DMX, Mary J. Blige, and find out what it was like having to represent their careers. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me as we speak with Angelo Ellerby. Welcome to What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander, the crossroads where culture, lifestyle, and community meet, all hosted by the legendary New York radio TV personality and proud Harlem American, G. Keith Alexander. Hey, that's me. How you doing? How are you? Welcome to What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. Uh, I just want to let you know I'm really happy to be here and uh, I'm glad that you were able to, uh, to join me this afternoon. We've got a wonderful guest. You're going to get a lot of inside juicy information, and we're going to have a lot of fun, too. Now, what do Michael Jackson, Mary J. Blige, Ronald Isley, uh, Dionne Warwick, Lee, uh, Lionel Richie, and, and Ava DuVernay have in common? Well, they've turned to a longtime media relations vet named Angelo Ellerby and his organization called Double Exposure for their career and artistic guidance. And Angelo, he's been a humanitarian and an activist. He's a PR specialist. He's brought more to the global community than just entertainment. Uh, he has uh, cemented his dedication to empowering artists, youths, and those in need for over five decades. His position as a filmmaker, executive producer, manager, fashion designer, and media guru is often used as a platform for giving back to others. So we welcome today the legendary PR specialist, Mr. Angelo Ellerby. Hello, Angelo. Welcome. Hey, man, what an introduction. Thank you. I have to carry you around down the street and up the street on the sideways for that kind of introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. It's a uh, pleasure to be with you today. Well, I'm so glad that you're here. So, so tell me, what, um, what is going on in your life presently? Everything, everything is going on. I have been working due diligence on my 19 clients that I have represented to this day. My staff and I have not stopped since this pandemic has occurred. Everything is virtual uh, and everything is still very demanding. And we've been working on uh, stimulating and educating our, our public, our fan base, our followers on social media and all other platforms. It's really important. This is a, this is a very strange time that I think that we all have to really have appreciation for it. We have to have an appreciation for this time. And I just believe that God speaks in silence. And I think the things that are taking place in this country now is a voice of God. And, mm -hmm. I, and I, I'm listening loud and I'm listening clear. Mm -hmm. What this time has done for me is brought togetherness. It has brought a culture of people together with care and concern and compassion for the next brother or the next sister. It has taken our young people and put them in a form in a form that has been magnificent. They have been due diligent. They have had energy and strive to fight for what our ancestors fought for in the 60s. They're bringing it all back. So I just believe the timing and what's going on now, unfortunately, has taken lives, but it's also created new lives and new opportunities for people who look like me. I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful time to really uh, get into who you are, get into your brothers and sisters and care just a little bit more. So, Well, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, that, that's just the bust of what I, what I happen to appreciate in this day and this time. Well, I was going to say that uh, that sounds like uh, your book, Sense of Success. Very much. Uh, tell, uh, tell, tell us uh, the, the, the book. What, what, what made you decide to write this book? I believe that life is a given. It's a gift from God. 
I believe that we as human beings make mistakes. We have trials, we have tribulations, particularly in the music industry. I find that so many people are accusatory as to why didn't, why didn't things happen the way we wanted it to happen. And then we would come to want to blame the managers or blame the record label or blame whomever. And I kind of have to say that no one is in blame of your life with yourself. You have, to, you have to own that. And you have to be able to simply say, if it didn't happen then, we all get second chances. We get third chances. And you have to brush off those evil demons that is running through our souls and simply say, let me just try this again. <laughs> now I have the wherewithals to get it together one more time, be very selective about who I bring to be a part of my team. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me work hard at this. Let me focus at this. And I can get another second chance at life. Cool. Away from entertainment, it also goes into that individual who's been incarcerated. It goes into the domestic violent end of it all. People need to understand that you do get a second chance in life and that you should not give up on life. And I do believe very much my book really covers being romantically in love with yourself. I really believe before I can ask someone to love me, I have to teach you how to love me. And I think love becomes a very important tool in our lives that we have to appreciate. So well, that's what the book really talks about. Well, okay, so that's great. Now, well, tell me about some of the um, uh, anecdotes that you have from your other book, which is Ask Angelo, and uh, where this book you've worked with many of your artists, and uh, you've, you've got some anecdotes perhaps our audience would like to hear, some behind-the-scenes stuff. From, sure, from I, you know, I was very much involved in terms of the education of my young artists. So this book, Ask Angelo, was a behind the scenes of what took place and how we began my artist development program. The New York Times had named my firm the Charm School for Rappers. I didn't <laughs> care particularly about the name, mm -hmm. but I cared the fact that people understood that we had to begin to educate our young people about the music industry. And I remember clearly Mary J. Blige had came to my office. And she came to my office and she was an hour late. And since she was an hour late, I went to lunch. She rung, she came up on the elevator. She says, well, I'm here to see Angelo. I said, can't be, you must be here to see Mr. Ellerby. <laughs> she said, oh, whatever. I said, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna do this tomorrow. The next day, she came one hour earlier. Mm -hmm. So how you start is how you finish. I don't believe in instant coffee. I believe in brewed coffee. And I think that my, my, my 24 week artist development program allows people to understand that it's not always now, it may be later. So my teachings with Mary seems to formulate a little bit like now, even though it was 10 years ago. She is now in a zone to be her own woman. She now understands what it is. She hated to come to my classes. Really? And we, but, but the key thing there, and I, I didn't have a problem with her not liking to come, but she came. And then I had, to, I had to bring her in. We had to begin to know one another, trust one another. And unfortunately, Mary came to me. When Mary came, my oldest son was killed. Ooh, shot. Sorry. And so the story goes is that my mom had called me up, told me I needed to come. And I said, okay. She told me what it was over the phone. But I owed a lot to my clients. And so I said, and she said, they tell me you don't listen to music, your artist music. I said, well, you're 100% correct. I don't. Because I'm not selling music. I'm selling talent. And the song was, if you could see what I see. And if you know the lyrical content of the song, it's a very touching song. It's a very emotional song. I started to cry. She started to cry. She began to tell me the story of her father. I began to tell her the story of my son. Mm. We gelled. Wow. We gelled and every other day she was there. She was there prompt. She became invigorated. She became excited about learning these things, man. It's a, 
it's a wonderful thing when you get to know yourself and you get to understand the business of music because I'm not teaching your talent. That's your craft. I'm teaching you about the, the, the 365 circles that you have to go into and how you have to adjust to each particular side of the music industry. Michael Jackson, the funniest thing happened. My, my assistant had left her desk and the phone rang. She asked me to cover it. Mm -hmm. So I answered the phone, double exposure. He says, I'd like to speak to uh, Angelo if I could. And I said, sure, who's calling him? He says, Michael Jackson. <laughs> and I looked at the phone like, okay, yeah, right. I said, and that's what I said to him. I said, yeah, right. Who is this trying to pull my leg? And he was like, no, Angelo, it's Michael Jackson. And then I said, Mr. Jackson? He said, Angelo, it's me. And I said, oh, sugar, <laughs> sugar. Uh, man, uh, but this man was just so charismatic, so caring, so concerned. Now, I didn't see, I saw the business side. I didn't see the, the other kind of demeanor at, that he presented to the public. I saw mm -hmm. a very hard-voiced gentleman who spoke uh, very firmly, uh, and I respected it. Uh, and we worked together for about two and a half years. So it was, it, was, it was an incredible experience. I dealt with him in the crisis time. I did damage control in the crisis time for him. So you so, did? Yeah. Each and every particular artist is not, man, it's just not about doing publicity and giving them TV and radio opportunities. It's about developing them it's about them giving them the wherewithals, how to stay longevity, how to stay in the game. Well, let me ask you this. Was it really tough doing damage control for Michael Jackson? Yeah, it was. It was very tough. I mean, where do you start? I mean, he just called you on the telephone, okay? So you're starting from zero. Where do you start with damage control? And I said to him, I think we need to go back to the scene of the accident. And he says, I don't understand. I said, so you're being accused of these things. So what we have to do is we have to create something that is going to whet the appetite of children. Why is it going to bring in the masses press, masses press to give visibility to your kindness and who you really are? Mm -hmm. So what we did is we created the Children's Choice Awards. Mm -hmm. In New York City, along with a gentleman by the name of Vince, I don't remember Vince's last name, but we did it, and it was the most phenomenal piece that I think that I've ever done. Because really? we didn't honor, we didn't just honor Michael Jackson, that was the highlight of the evening, but we did Mrs. Cuomo, and then we did some other elected officials, mm -hmm. and we salted the whole place full of children. When he walked on this stage, it was incredible. And so all of what was being talked about was no longer talked about. It was now, this is a man that cares about his, his fan base, his children. He does love them and the whole other bit. And we got every newspaper across the country. So I think that it, it, you have to really be able to think outside of the box. You can't just go along with what the gossip folk are saying. Let's erase all of that. Let's not entertain that. But let's look forward to creating new opportunities that will receive, that will remove the negative and bring on the positive. Wow. So, all right. So then uh, your damage control was successful in doing what? Uh, what eventually happened down the line that uh, was a result of you being a part of Michael's. I think the end result was that we hit some 24 newspapers across the country, uh, the view and the outline for what he was supposed to do allegedly was no longer there. It was, it was a change. It was a new attitude. This was a, a, a gentleman that had respect for not just the children, but for the parents and the parents was loving and seeing that he was loved. And I think we wind up giving out scholarships as well. So that was, I don't know if that was a solution, but it did come up as a 
give back into the community so that it can really touch and feel and understand the sensitivities of another human being, as it was Mr. Jackson. So let me ask you this. Did you ever have to do damage control for Whitney Houston? Never had to do any damage control for Ms. Houston. Uh, now she was I, a I client of yours. To, Excuse she, me? She, she was a client of yours? She was a client of mine. She were, I worked in tangent with her along with her cousin, Miss Warwick. But I didn't have to do any damage control. Uh, what I had to do was to, she had a production company and a management company. And Nippy there were Inc. several, excuse me? Nippy Inc. No, Nippy Inc. was the modeling agency. Oh, this I was see. for recording artists, and they were based out of New, they were based out of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And they sent to me, I think it was Robin Crawford, had sent to me via through Vincent Herbert, sent mm -hmm. to me about three or four of their groups uh, to get into artist development. I think it was a group called Into You that went platinum, and it was two other groups. Mm -hmm. And so the relationship, we worked on a daily basis in terms of the productivity, the advancement, uh, the, styliz the, the stylization of the artist, diction, speech, and mannerisms. So we, it, it was not like the representation on a day-to-day -day basis. We worked in tangent to bring together her artists as professionally as we possibly could bring those artists to fold. I see, I see. So uh, of all the artists that you've had to work with, um, which one do you think you help to develop more than, than, than the others? I, I mean, think they, it would, I think it would have to be Mary J. Blige. Mary J. So you, you put the, the, you took the edges off and put the polish on. Is, is that it? Absolutely. I think that, I didn't think it was a little bit more than taking the edges off and putting the polish on. It was making her understand how beautiful she was, the work that she had that she was a woman with her own mind, that she was a businesswoman, and she needs to carry herself in that manner. So it was a lot more than that. And then I think when you talk about my alignment to DMX, uh, I managed DMX for four years. I was his publicist for two years. Uh, none of that was trying, to put it mildly. <laughs> really? That was trying. But I, I, I always mirrored and applauded his ability to love in God. Mm -hmm. uh, Any time that I ever had a problem with Earl, we would always, I would always say, man, I think what we should do is pray. Mm -hmm. Because when you're having all the very trials and tribulations of life, there has to be a way to get into that person. I'm not going to try to play psychiatrist but I am gonna to try to play friend. And I am gonna to try to make you aware of the rights and the wrongs of your life. I'm going to help you. And the key thing about what I go to do or what my attempts are, is that it's not just about the artist. It's about the artist's wife, the artist's children, his and her environment. Well, Angelo, let's yeah. leave it right there for a moment because we're going to have to take a break in about 30 seconds. But I, I, I do want to uh, remind our, our public that when we come back, we're going to be talking with Angelo Ellerby. He is a uh, PR specialist. He's legendary. And uh, he's going to talk to us. You know, when we come back, I, I'd like to find out. I, I know there's a story in your Ask Angelo about a knife. So if you don't mind, I'd like, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear more about that. So we'll be right back uh, after we uh, take a break. This is Jinky sure. Alexander on What's Hot Harlem America. You're listening to What's Hot Harlem America with Jinky Alexander. To reach our show live today, call in to 1-866-472-5788. That's 1-866-472-5788. Also, you can send an email to Alexander at harlemamerica.com. Now, back to the show. Well, thank you so very, very much. It is What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. And I just want to let you know that uh, 
we have a public service announcement I want to do real quick. The Chamber, the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, continues to work tirelessly through the pandemic experience in concert with our medical, educational, business, banking, elected officials, nonprofits, and individual partners to provide much needed services. To support those most severely impacted by the pandemic, social inequalities, systemic racism, and economic challenges, the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce has created a GoFundMe campaign, Support Harlem Now, assisting our senior citizens, children, students, small businesses, food banks, the homeless, art and culture, not-for-profits, and many families in need. If you have questions or need additional information, please call 212-862-7200, or you can email them at info at harlemdiscover.com, info at harlemdiscover.com. All right, got the public service out of the way for our Harlem community, and uh, we are now talking to, once again, Mr. Angelo Ellerby. And Angelo, tell me about the knife. Wow. You know, we were just talking about DMX, and uh, I was not just DMX's manager and publicist, but I was also the president of his label, which was on Def Jam. The label was called Bloodline. And Earl had, I, Earl took on about maybe 13 or 14 different artists, signed them to his label. And of course, I oversee, supervised, and managed his label. And I was very well responsible for these acts. When I got involved, there, there was no budget. The budget had just disappeared. Don't ask me how, but it was magical. <laughs> it just disappeared. Uh -huh. So I had to be able to tell each and every artist about what's not going to happen versus what is going to happen. But in one particular artist, I selected to uh, really nurture because I thought they were extremely talented. So I would do these things like when Earl would go to perform in front of 20 or 30,000 people, I would encourage this artist to go uh, and open for Earl and that kind of thing there. And then I was able to get, I think off of the film that we had did and it was underneath the Bloodline label, uh, able to get some monies to uh, refresh our budgets. And so I did a music video and then things were not moving as fast as this artist wanted them to move. So my office being on 7th Avenue around the corner from Def Jam, uh, this gentleman came to my office about eight o'clock in the morning. So he was there when the assistant opened up the office. So he went in the back when I was coming up the elevator, I go into my office and then the door opens. So when the door opens, I'm like, yo, what, do you, what is going on? So he had a knife. G. Keith, it was about, um, it, I don't even know if you call it a knife. I think it was more like a sword. Ooh. And he came over to me and he says, I'm sick and tired of this going on back and forth. There ain't nothing happening with my career. I should kill you right now. <laughs> oh. Okay, so I'm now like stunned, mm -hmm. nervous. I don't blame you. So I... So he says, I want to talk to Earl now. So I would call Earl. Now I would say, Earl, somebody's in the office that needs to speak to you. He was like, so what's going on? What's going on? So I, the person would get on the phone, click. <laughs> we did it two times. Click. We did it the third time. Click. Now the blade is at my throat. This was wow. not a blade that was sitting down. It was a pin of the blade in my throat. Ooh. So I couldn't really talk. <clears throat> so when he finally found out that it was not me that was stopping mm -hmm. further development of his career, mm -hmm. we had a conversation. And then I said to him, now you can get the, out of my office. Now, years go by. We go to the Black Girls Rock, and I'm with Dionne Warwick. Okay. So this this person is on the floor waving like the king that came through the door. So I thought it was for Ms. Warwick. 
I said, man, why don't you get up off the floor? He said, man, I feel so sorry. I feel so bad. I've gone through all these years. I did this to you. Da, 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 da. I said, man, I'm living, you living, you doing you, and that's what's good. Just keep moving. So yeah, so it's not been, my, my career has not been a bed of roses. That's just one of the things that have taken place. When you, and that's why I keep saying to keep that it's so very important that we don't just take these artists because we have talent. We have to take them and tell them what is going to possibly happen to you when you enter into the music industry. We have to begin to mentor them. We need to let them know about the who, what's, and the whens, and the where's, and the why's of the circle of this business. They have to know the business. They can't just sit up and sign a contract and think that everything on this contract is going to manifest themselves. You have to be selective about the kinds of people that you put into your life so that you understand that you have a body of people that's going to be in support and that has a vision of your dream. But when you take the boy down the street, who don't know no more than you know, um, he's running your career. <laughs> and what he's really doing is ruining your career. When you want to take 40 and 50 people on a flight with you, uh, do you think the record company is just giving you that? It's called recoupables. So when you go back to get your money and you say, well, there ain't no money on there, well, because you don't spend it. <laughs> but it's an education of it all. And I find myself doing that more and more every day uh, because I want them to understand. You talking to me, it's not, I'm not free. Yeah. You obey yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. And when you go to talk to your lawyer, he ain't talking to you for free. You're going to pay him. So clearly for me, it's just like so many things that I've gone through in my career that have been good, bad, and indifferent. I try to share them all, either in book, in conversation, but sharing it. Well, let me ask you, uh, in your 24-week development uh, course, and mm -hmm. there are many artists uh, who are probably listening to this all around the country, uh, and they would like to know what it is that they need to learn. So very quickly, very succinctly, can you tell us what that 24-week course will, will teach an artist, groom an artist? First, we go into taxation, pay your taxes. We go into publishings, royalties. Then we go into things like style, diction, speech, mannerisms, interview techniques. So they, and they all are electives. Because we're always on the road, you can't sit down sometime and take 24 weeks. You elect the courses in which you want. And I have keen professionals that come in for two hours and give you the who, what, when's, where, and why's of what your, what your budget is from the record company, with how you must pay your taxes, how you must make sure that things are documented and that you get receipts. All of these things become important because you can look at all of our brothers and sisters who have sold millions and millions and millions of records and have absolutely nothing and don't have the understanding of why they don't have anything. So it becomes important that before we throw them on the stage mm -hmm. and they sing their songs and they're fantastic, that we take some nurture, nurturing time to educate them about what could possibly happen. So when it did, happens, they're prepared. Did, did you catch Lionel Richie uh, after the Commodores uh, uh, or in the height of his Lionel Richie success or in the beginning of his Lionel Richie success? In the beginning, in the beginning. And what, when did, it you, was, what did you have to do for him? Well, you know, it's, it, it, the company was set up an artist, art, an artist development firm, a publicity firm, and then we did image and style. And so it was more, it was more publicity than it was anything else. And so my team consists of nine people they all have various areas of expertise. If it is hip hop, if it's R&B, if it's reggae, whatever the genre is, there were publicists that dealt with in those areas. And then each and every single other publicist had to contribute to the day of activity of interviews. So we weren't just targeted into their market. 
we were targeting into other markets, which gave them a global acceptance. And it wasn't just pertaining to their genre of music. At what stage did you uh, start working with uh, Alicia Keys? In the very early stage, in the very, very early stages when Alicia was totally unaware of uh, the greatness of who she was. She came directly after Mary, if not at the same time of Mary, young and sweet and innocent, and where the record companies were not just loving who Alicia Keys was. They couldn't identify with image or style. Uh, and Alicia and I had a very, very good relationship. We were able to talk about uh, what she should be doing, how she should be doing, and and, and, and I think that she has found her own at this particular stage of the game. So Alicia was totally 100% nothing but artist development for me. And I think that's when they must have terminated the relationship with her at Columbia. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, I think it was Demet Gidry who was overseeing Columbia. And Demet mm -hmm. and I were very good friends. And he sent me Alicia and said, Angela, I just think you should talk with her and she should go through your artist development program. And that's, that's what happened. But a wow. wonderful, wonderful lady. She turned out beautiful. I mean, she, she, she's wonderful. Uh, and, uh, you know, she seems like the go-to person now whenever there's a big event on television, they want her to sit there with the uh, piano or, or host something. And, and she, she's, you, you did a great job. So, so I say to you, it's not about, it's not ever about instant coffee. You have to drink brewed coffee. And with instant coffee, it comes and it goes, but with brewed coffee, it takes a time. And I think that is, that, that's how I view what I do. I brew the coffee and it's not gonna to happen today, but it may happen tomorrow. And you're gonna hear my voice. Every time you go do something wrong, you're gonna hear Angelo's voice and you don't wanna hear Angelo's voice. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and it takes that little. So I tell them to drink that brewed coffee. Don't ever go to that instant coffee. Everybody's a star for fifteen minutes. And if you take the word star and spell it back backwards, that's not what I'm creating. Hmm. Wait a minute. Star backwards would Rats. be. Uh... <laughs> Rats. <laughs> okay. Rats. Wow. Well. Okay. So so now, just recently, we saw the magnificent superstar, uh, Miss Dionne Warwick on uh, Versus. Uh, she joined Gladys and uh, Patty. And uh, you have been representing Miss Dionne uh, 36 for years. 36 years, cheese and crackers. I mean, she's got a hundred this, she's got a hundred that. She's got, uh, I mean, you know, she's got what, Grammys up the yin yang. She's got, uh, oh, so, did did you get her from the beginning as well or or, or? years but you know what i'm gonna tell you something with miss warwick and i do say miss warwick um it's very different uh she and i are on the same level i would learn so much from her and i think she learned so much for from me we identify we i don't know if we identify because we're from newark new jersey I don't know if we identify because of the barrier of the bulls that have taken place in our lives, but that her energy is enough to put anyone on a cloud. When we have problems, or if there is a problem as it may relate to publicity, as it may relate to just everyday walks of life, we talk, we talk, we sit down, we talk, we have our coffee, and how do we work these strategies? How do we do what we need to do? How do we get from that that hill to that flat that that flat foundation? It has been thirty six years of greatness, and I say greatness only because the kind of energy, insightfulness, and preparation that she goes through, and I have adapted a lot of her ways in terms of understanding how to get out of the roadblock. If there's a detour, I've never seen this lady stop for nothing, for nothing. 
if there's a trial, a tribulation, if there's a death, if there's this, she finds a detour and she gets away from it. And I think that's, you know, to see her and Patty and to see her, Patty and Gladys together, I was blown away. And we need to see more of that. Our young people need to understand these are the these are the shoulders that you stand on. Respect that. Respect that these are the shoulders. These are the people who fought that fight for you. These are the people who could not stay in hotels, but yet they can sing in those hotels. They have. These are the young ladies that fought that fight for you. Yeah, yeah. And we yeah. need to applaud it. Well, well, well let me. Ask. You're absolutely right. Let me tell you, I have. Um, been uh backstage with uh, dion uh i've been the uh the announcer at uh, carnegie hall when 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 dion uh was uh, performing for ray chu and and vivian chu uh chu entertainment the people oh yes and uh, i love them and and i've been backstage uh, at the apollo as the announcer also when dion's been there and i'm in i'm in such awe of dion that I've taken photographs with her, but I don't know what to say to her because I watched her. I I watched her singing for Burt Bacharach. You know, when I was a kid, she was. I mean, this woman. You know, with, with all these these hits and everything. I, I I'm just. I don't know what to say to her when Do I. Do you know see what, G. Keys? What? See, I have my mentor is James M. Tume, oh, James who wrote all of the wonderful songs for Stephanie Mills and on and on. Juicy and I began in stuff. doing publicity because of M2MA. Mm -hmm. And M2MA and I were on the phone last week. And I told him, I said, Tooms, can I call you right back? Miss Warwick is on the line. He said, Ansel, really, man? Don't tell me that she's on that phone. I was like, M2MA, what is wrong with you? <laughs> he said, man, I wrote, if you understand all the songs I wrote, it was all females. She mm -hmm. said, because I loved her voice. This I said, but she lives right up the street from you. He said, I saw her in the bank, but I walked <laughs> up to her and I said, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> I was like, in two me. <laughs> yeah. And I, it was so funny when he called, when he called me on my other phone, she called and really? I began to tell her. I said, Miss Warwick, do you know in two me? She said, yeah, I know in two me. And I'm telling, I'm telling him, I'm telling her this with him on the phone. And he was like, oh, my God. I, and I was like, yeah, she's approachable. She's a wonderful <laughs> individual. And she lives right up the street from you. Go have a wow. cup of coffee. Incredible. So, yeah. Incredible. So, uh, all right, we, we've got one minute left. And uh, I want to take a break. Uh, and But I, I, I want to say this to uh, folks listening now that uh, What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander and the Harlem America Digital Network are making plans to create soulful experiences for our membership community after the COVID is over. So please go to harlemamerica.com and sign up to become a member so that uh, you'll be aware of all the things that we're gonna be doing here at Harlem America Digital uh, Network. So I'm G. Keith Alexander, of course, uh, you probably already know that. And we're with the, uh, the famous legendary Angelo Ellerbee, and uh, we'll be back in perhaps maybe uh, a few minutes. Uh, so stick around. Please call someone. Let them know that uh, they've missed a lot. Okay. I'm G. Keith Alexander, and this is Harlem America. Well, yes, uh, we, we're here with uh, uh, Angelo Ellerby. And, and Angelo, you know, uh, I want to ask you a question about, uh, you've been to Harlem many times, right? Yes. What is it? that you love about Harlem? I love my people. I love my people. I love my people. I love the streets, the festivity, the activities. I love, I, 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 when I go to Harlem, I feel like I'm just home. It's just home for me. And I, I bring friends of mine from other countries into Harlem and it's just, it's not, it's a comfort. It's a comfort of knowing your culture. It's a comfort of just, you know, it's like that. It's like going to the Apollo Theater. It's a legend. It's a legendary community. It certainly is. And the last time I, I saw you in Harlem, I believe we were at the um, 
debut cool the debut of Cool's new champagne called right. Lake Cool. Stay, stay tell, stay cool. tell us about that. Lake Cool, well, first of all, uh, giving all respects to Cool and his brother Ronald, who just passed. Yes, uh, it, to it has been a wonderful, fantastic relationship working with him. Uh, he is a man that is clear to understand his direction of life. And he works like he's 16 years old. He works with the energy, with a drive, with insight to know what he wants to do. So one day he calls me up and he says, well, I, I, I got some more cabbage for you. That's the money is cabbage for you. I got some more cabbage for you. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, Angel, I'm going to do a champagne line. I said, that's interesting. I said, so what's the name of it? He says, La Cool Champagne. And I laughed. And I said, cool, are you serious? He said, yeah, I'm serious. And guess what? I said, what? It's all yours. Make it happen. And mm -hmm. so that year they honored him. That I think it was WBLS along with a Harlem, uh, or Harlem Discovery. Mm -hmm. Honored cool. And they did a huge thing for him in the park. And then we did something at a restaurant. That was Harlem uh, Week. It was wonderful. So many of his fans came out. We we passed the champagne out to everyone. And, and today, I, had, I had a chance to sample it. It, it was divine. It was a little good. Yeah. Um, so now that now the, the line of the champagne is selling, um, I think, in 48 cities. So it's doing extremely well. Uh, we have a list of promotional things that he's going to be doing in the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, you know, he's a man that um, once he puts his mind to it, it's going to get done. I, 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 I love Cool. I love Cool's energy. Even I though he too. calls me 16 times out of the day, I love him. <laughs> I do too. We go way back uh, somewhere in like 1972 or 73. I had a birthday party down at the Empire State Building. There used mm -hmm. to be this, this restaurant called the Riverboat uh, underneath the Empire State Building. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, uh, and I, I didn't know Cool at all prior to that, but he and, and the gang showed up. Uh, uh, I think with Nat Adderley Jr. Uh, and and they they played my birthday party for me. And really? It, it, yeah. It, it, and and so I got a chance to to meet. So so I, I've uh, been uh, a fan ever since then. And uh, you know the guy is great. Uh, I, and I love the music. And uh, you know his his family is wonderful. And and of course. Uh, uh, I, I I loved his wife. Uh, ah, Sakina. I was in, I was romantically in love with his wife. She, she loved 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 his yes, wife. Yes, yes. His wife was beautiful. She was charming. She was delightful. She represented Cool in the Gang and the best. Oh, I love me some Sakina. Oh yes, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I, I was at her um, roller skating party that she gave about uh, two years ago. Uh, it was jammed, packed. I mean, people were, uh, uh, if I could use the term, uh, asshole to belly button. I mean, it was, it was that packed. <laughs> I mean, you know. They fought, uh, they fought for Sakina and Cool created the foundation called Cool Kids Foundation. And it was to fill the void in the absence of music in schools. And that's how all the, the various things that Sakina would do was to sponsor and to raise funds and awareness for Cool's Kids Foundation. Well, they did a great job, yeah. I'm telling you. Sakina was, um, she was my heart. So uh, what's on the horizon now for Double Exposure, for Angelo Ellerby? Well, some years ago, 20th Century Fox brought my life story. Really? Um, I was not pleased with the writing of it. We're now revisited. We're revisiting it, mm -hmm. and so now we're we're, we're we're excuse me. We're really considering to maybe bring my life to to theater to movie. Really? Yeah, fantastic. So so then that means in order to do that, some of the artists that you've managed or or I'm sorry, represented, uh, they will have to have 
actors play them or they'll represent they'll play themselves or what i would think there would be certain people that i would want to play themselves and then the others you know i i I adore Antonio Fargus, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. who's a very dear client, but more of a friend. Mm -hmm. um, I would truly want Antonio to be a part of my life story. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, I want to make a role of it for those young heads. Uh, I want to bring in a lot of those people that I really know to be a part of it. I really would like to, of course, include Dion, include as many people as I can get to be a part of it, but yeah, the rest of them they can, they can go and cast them. But I, well, I'm going to make sure that my finger is on the pulse of my, my biop. Fantastic. Well, you know, if you need a DJ's voice coming through, hey, a speaker, you know what? Then, I'm gonna hey, call you, call yeah. the agent. My people will call your people, and you right. Know, uh, you know, I, I hope you saw me in my last film, uh, The Intern, with uh, Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. Oh, I absolutely did. I got I mean, that You're going to make me go and Google it now. Uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I did that. So, uh, you know, I got my SAG card and everything. In fact, uh, if I may just blow my own horn, I'm, I'm uh, uh, at home one day, and I realized that, I'm, I'm, uh, that I had gotten a phone call that I had missed, and it was from Shirley Ralph. And uh, she, and I I went to the uh, voicemail and listened to it and Shirley Ralph is Gee Keith Gee Keith I, I'm on a flight to somewhere blah blah and I put on the movie uh, the in flight movie and it's you on uh, on the intern. <laughs> That's a good feeling when you see yourself and others see you as well, G. Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I'm putting in the plug. I'd like to be in the Angela oh, absolutely. Ellerbe absolutely. Ep epic movie. Okay. Absolutely, buddy. No casting for you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So uh, now, uh, you, your life started. Uh, I think you briefly said that you, you started in a record company, uh, or you started working with uh, in, in Tume. Gave I you the started, first shot. I started in the corners of my mother's basement in Newark, New Jersey. I started doing, I designed clothes. I did design for years. Mm -hmm. And then I went into fashion. I did fashion promoting. That's for, why you've always been such a stylish dresser. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and, 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 and you're on the cover of some, you're on the I'm cover on the of a cover magazine. Of, uh, <laughs> Sapphire Emerald this month. And I'm very, very honored to be a part of, uh, for them to select me to be on the cover. And I'm like, why couldn't this happen 25 years ago when this is what I, <laughs> but you know, I'll take it as they give it to me. Sure, so yeah, sure. there's a wonderful magazine, a wonderful fashion magazine, and they spotlight on my life. And it's, um, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling for, for people. Uh, I was just telling somebody, don't give me no flowers when I'm dead. Give me all my flowers right now. I want to smell them. I want to see them. <laughs> I want all of it in my, don't do nothing for me when I can't do anything that show my appreciation for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the cover is a good thing for me at this point. I'm happy for, about it. Great, great. So do you ever think about, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this is gonna be a bad word, retiring? I'm gonna retire when I go in that box and I'm face up. As you long feel. as I can keep getting a check, as long as they keep giving <laughs> me a check, I'm gonna keep working. Well, that's the, you know, the way I feel. A, a lot of people around our age are, are thinking about winding down and mm -hmm. uh i'm just winding up there i mean you, go. you know uh, i there i I'm, I'm, with all the the experience and the knowledge and the contacts and the the uh the name recognition uh i'm just winding up to I'm create with you. to, to create totally the harlem you. america digital network wow you know i am totally 100 percent with you i'm going to keep this boat afloating as long as there's some water in the sea I'm going to float on and go on. Is there a particular artist that you have now that you'd like to tell the public about? I'm working with a number of young artists. This is one R&B artist that I'm really excited about. His name is Troy, his name is Troy Tyler. And he has a record that we're starting to put out called Good Good. And we're very excited about it. He's 23 years old. He's a, a, a wonderful performer, but a great uh, writer. Uh, and producer, and I'm excited about Troy. I, and then there is a young gentleman that I'm working with called Raz B. That used to be a part of what was uh, B2K. 
And so we're going to revisit his career and put his career and position his career to where we thought it should be. And so, yeah, so I take him, I take him on because I take on new artists because I love the challenge of it all. And particularly when they were there before and they want to come back again, that's when I really get excited because it's breaking ground. I believe if you did it before, you can do it again. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so with uh, the advent of social media being so prominent in everyone's lives today, what has changed with the record industry or the entertainment industry? I think that, I mean, sure, the old formula and the new formula is what I use. Uh, and I think that's what keeps me relevant. I, I keep very young people around me with regards to all those things that are social media driven. Uh, I use my ingredients of my way of doing things. They show me their way of doing things and then we marry. Uh, I'm not going to ever think that I'm at an age level that I can't survive. So you got to learn how to survive. And if, if, if young kids are relating in one particular matter, then I need to relate that too, but you're going to learn my way too. So <laughs> that we both understand it's a give and take. And I want to give and I want to take. And so uh, I, I welcome what is going on in this whole virtual world. Uh, but I'm still going to go for those hardcore TV shows, those printed magazines, those online magazines. So it's all a marriage. Or if it's not a marriage, it truly is an engagement. I see, I see. So what would you tell someone listening right now who perhaps someone has said, you know, you've got a voice. You should really try and do something with it uh, so very succinctly because we've got about uh, three minutes left uh, i would simply say if you have a voice and you believe that you have a voice you should go see people like ken hicks who's a vocal coach i think that i mean still to this day mary j Blige and uh mariah carey and all these people they have to take care of this because this is the money maker so the vocal co coach is going to teach you all the elements of projection, how to save the jo a voice, how to, you got to deal with the, you have to deal with taking care of what's going to take care of you. Vocal training is important. So I, if you are a singer, you need to go enhance that. You need to go take some dance lessons because the show, your shows have got to always be explosive. It's always good just to expound and want to bring that career of yours up to a level that can never ever be, you can't compete against excellence, excuse me. You can't, when you have all of the package, you know, we, we talk about Beyonce, it's because the father taught artist development, what the importance was of, for a stage to get on the stage, how to look people dead in the eye, how to speak, how to sit. All those things make up a package to be a superstar like a Beyonce. It didn't just, she didn't, it didn't just happen. Somebody <laughs> swore. LRB, 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 LRB Elegance is the name of your, uh, your uh, candle company. And uh, we've got about, uh, about a minute left. And I just want to tell you, Angelo, this has been really wonderful to uh, get a chance to chat with you and, and uh, you give advice to the, uh, the, the artists uh, out there that, that are, are trying to get into the business and, uh, on, a, on a big level. Uh, and also the fact that you were so generous to be able to share so much information with us behind the scenes. It's been a pleasure, Angelo, and you're always welcome back on What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. And I just want to thank you again. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure being with you. Check me out next Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific. We'll be here and hopefully we'll have someone really, 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 really great. So be on the lookout. I'm G. Keith Alexander. Have a great day and a better one tomorrow. And don't judge your brother or sister too harshly until you've walked a mile in his or her sneakers or shoes or, or sandals or whatever they're wearing. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you.